Welcome to She Speaks Fierce, our first YouTube edition. If you have not already subscribed to our newsletter, we have a weekly newsletter, She Thinks Fierce, that comes out. We also have a TikTok, an Instagram a podcast, and now our YouTube video. Please subscribe, like, and join us for the strongest international women's community around the world. Joining us today as our first guest is Katrina Johnson, a very dear friend of mine. I'm going to let her introduce herself and then we'll get started. Go ahead. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Katrina Johnson, like she said. I am 41, a wife and mom of four. Um, ranging from, I have a seat, my first senior this year down to a second grader, three boys and a girl. Um, gosh, what else do you want to know? <laughs> um, how do you deal with three boys? <laughs> and which is they're harder, the three boys or the one girl? Well, they're expensive to feed. That's for sure. <laughs> um, my little girl, well, so our three boys were planned every two years apart, and then she was a surprise five years after our youngest, and so best surprise ever, but she is like raising a, uh, an oldest child again, and so she is just full of sass, and she's wild. <laughs> and adorable, and, and just like her mom oh, okay yes <laughs> yes yes no they we are very blessed we, we we definitely got some of the best ones excellent well I'm not a mother myself so all I can do is live vicariously through my friends and family that have kids and seems you take the mothering role very responsibly and do very well with it I do try my best and then some. <laughs> How was it starting off versus today? Would you say that you have changed, changed your, your way of doing things? Did you need to adapt for each child? How did that work? Yes, there was adaptation for each of them. Um, before I became a mom, I nannied for my sister. So I was able to help raise two of my nieces. Um, you know, babysitting the, them during the day and whatnot. So it kind of gave me a little bit of a start with, you know, the whole mothering thing. Um, but definitely different being an aunt versus a mom. Um, and then going from two girls, my nieces to my boys was definitely a change as well. Um, then I have seen a difference though between the boys and the girls but it's you know it's all been good uh -huh. mostly <laughs> again would you say one's easier or harder boys versus girls just different okay different perspectives different lessons what's different uh Give me a few all minutes. of it, all of it, just the way they think, the way they act from bouncing off the walls and climbing things to uh, just the things that they enjoy. And I don't know, I they still require the same amount of love. <laughs> OK, there's my answer. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I, as you know, I have 32 nephews and nieces and four great nephews as of this year. Wow. And uh, yeah, I'm still so young, so I don't know how that happened. But I will say understanding, you know, how to take care of kids. I get this. But the transition between becoming an aunt versus becoming a mother I'm not sure I'm ready for that yet that still scares the living daylights out of me <laughs> I don't think anyone is really ever ready as uh -huh. they you know say to be it's just you just dive in head first you just do it <laughs> figure it Finger out swim. You go. <laughs> yep uh, okay so what has this taught about you, you about you how has mothering helped you learn about yourself it has helped teach me that I am more capable than I allow myself to believe that I am. 
um, you just figure out how to make everything work all the time. And I try to devote, uh, I mean, my kids are my passion. I love my children and I love being a mom. Um, it has taught me that there are things about myself that I've wanted to change Okay. from views and beliefs that I had from growing up and doubts and those sort of things. Um, not wanting my children to have to feel or think the same way. Um, so I guess that's played a huge role in helping me to become a better version of myself. Any examples you're willing to share? Um, yeah. So growing up, I was in honors classes and, you know, was pushed to do my best, not necessarily in a bad way or anything like that, but I just had this overlooming, you know, do better, be better, excel, strive type of thing. Maybe it sure. was our generation. I don't know, <laughs> but it put a lot of pressure on me. Um, a lot of stress, a lot of um, an unneeded anxiety, I guess. And so I don't want my kids to, I want them to do well. I want them to do their best, but I don't want to make them feel pressured that they have to suffer or mentally strain um, to have to to reach a certain level, like anything is okay. You know, again, I want them to do their best and I encourage them to do their best. And I know when they're not trying their hardest, but I once heard a quote um, in a business class I was taking about how C's still get degrees. And that was really profound to me because, you know, I was A's and B's and A pluses and whatever else, you know, and I'm like, you know what? That's true. Uh -huh. We don't have to. I mean, it's good to push yourself. It's good to learn. I promote that definitely. Um, but the unneeded stress, you know, that that put on myself, um, whether I did that on my own or whatever, um, I don't want my kids to have to experience that. Yeah. So I'm trying to, you know, change how they perceive um school and that sort of stuff where sometimes it is just a test it doesn't define who you are a grade doesn't define who you are have any of your kids picked up on that perfectionist behavior they when they were younger I think they started to but as they grew I think we both were in a mind shift of it's okay to not I remember being in tears over math homework and, you know, all of these stressful things, um, being that we went to the same high school together. Uh, you are well aware of all of the, the push of doing well. Um, oh yeah. All nighters and all kinds of really fun, stressful activities as a teenager. Yeah. Yeah. I, it builds character. Okay. I'll say that, <laughs> but I think the world has kind of shifted anyway. Um, like, for example, um, you know, for us to get into colleges before, you know, the ACT and the the SAT, I mean, those were like, you had to have your scores to be able to get in. And like, uh, obviously, tests. <laughs> COVID has kind of shifted that and, you know, made it, that is kind of just a test. I mean, yes, it's a baseline, which is good. Um, I'm a little envious of that, I have to say. Yes, I, I am as well. But um, I don't know. I think it's been a, a growing pattern for them and myself all at the same time. I, I mean, that's a great point, though, because think about how many things in life are not going to be perfect. And yeah. in fact, I mean, you're going to be lucky getting away with C quality work because yeah. there are just so many impossibilities in the world. Um, yes. I mean, I feel like this touches very closely on the newsletter I put out yesterday about being the queen of failure. And yes. That's how I feel because anything less than an A for me is definitely failure status. Yes. Um, but 
at the end of the day, it all leads somewhere better. And yeah. who's grading me anyway, anymore? This is self-evaluation if yes. I'm being true to myself, because what other people think about me, I mean, that's just their own thoughts and their own perspective. It's right. a reflection of their own inner mindset. But what do I think yes. about myself? How am I grading myself? Is this a pass or failure class? Or is this an A, B, C, D, F class or A, B, C? Right. Yeah. <laughs> now they don't do F. So this is another <laughs> fun transition. We're, we're oh, down wow. to numbers in the elementary school. It's a one, two, three, four <laughs> system. So it's just, it's all wonky these days. Yeah. Again, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly how we're doing it here, but. You know, to me, passive failure is, are you still doing it? Are you still working? Are you still standing up? Are you still waking up every day? Are you getting out of bed? <laughs> this yeah. is a pass. Anything else? Yeah. I mean, if you can talk to me today, you're passing. Yep. Right? Uh, there is no book about how to do it the best way and what to do the best way. And, you know, there are a lot of people that want to give advice as to how to do it the best way. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, but I got to say, I have not been one that has ever fit into that category of someone else telling me exactly how to do it would work for me. And, and we're all unique. So yeah. there's a different story for all of us, a different way that works, a different, I mean, all of it. So it's hard yeah. to, you can't compare. So what have you learned most distinctly about you maybe not even just because of being a mother or a wife but after all of these years of trying to get to know yourself better what would you say is maybe one of the most powerful messages you have learned or are learning I am enough okay that's a good I... one you know as a, a mom since we've talked about kids um, you know, am I doing enough? Am I there enough? Am I present enough? Am I teaching enough? Am I all of these things, you know, and as a wife, am I, am I good enough? Am I, you know, all of these things that we, these pressures, like in one of your newsletters that you put out about being superwoman and, you know, having all of these things, these ideas in our head that social media and the media movies, all these things, you know, put in our mind that we have to be, um, it's a lot of pressure. Yeah. And yeah. quite frankly, through all of it, I am me. I am unique and I am enough for my situation. I'm enough for my kids and my husband. And most importantly, I'm enough for me. That's the important part that I think that I've, one of the biggest lessons, I'm still working on that is still... <laughs> you know, an ongoing thing. Um, that may be one of the life lessons. It, it takes a lifetime well, life, to really understand. <laughs> yes. And life shifts and changes and things happen. And there's always more to learn about being enough. But having that foundation to be able to lean on um, when things get sticky and hard and frustrating and whatever else, just remembering, you know what? It's okay whatever it is, because I'm enough and we'll get through whatever situation it is. And today you may have 10% to give or less. Yep. I've had those 1% days and I'm not a mom or a yep. wife. <laughs> and again, 10% yeah. is generous for these days. I would call them 1% days where you're like, I don't think I can get out of bed today, but I'm awake. And that's okay. <laughs> And you this know. is as good as it's going to get today, but tomorrow yeah. we'll work on tomorrow. Yeah. So when you have these harder times, the times when you feel like you're less than, I'm not going to say hundred percent. I don't feel like I'm ever a hundred percent. And maybe that's just me. But when you feel like you're less than your, your highest best, how do you self-prioritize? How do you help yourself? feel better or feel stronger or work on yourself. I mean, because especially being a mom and a wife, that must be a challenge. Uh, it definitely is a challenge. Um, there are certain things that I try to do to help keep balance with all of those things to, I don't want to say distract my mind, but to give me some sense of self-care. Um, I 
really have found that I like dirt. Okay. It, <laughs> they talk about grounding and all of that kind of stuff. And yeah. um, gardening has actually been like one of the biggest things that I feel has been very beneficial in my self-care. Um, I live in a really rural area. And so we have um, some space to be able to garden and it's kind of the thing to do because it's a slower paced life here. So I'm that whole homesteading thing, you know, is trying, trying to where I'm trying to shift my life to, um, okay. but being in the dirt and watching things grow and taking care of the plants and that sort of thing, like that brings me joy. Um, alongside that, I am a crazy chicken lady and <laughs> currently have 29 chickens. I can't believe I just said that online. Wow. You um, should list this with your children. <laughs> well, my daughter's like, and in 29 chickens, <laughs> my daughter is like, Oh, I can't, I don't have real sisters, but I've got chicken sisters. <laughs> so but they are part of the, the family. That makes sense. Yes. They are, they're, they're spoiled, they're spoiled chickens. So, um, those two things kind of bring me a sense of release from life, you know, being able to care for other things, I guess that's always kind of been in my nature to care and, you know, love things. Um, so those, and then in winter time, because obviously you can't really garden in the snow here in Utah, um, we do use um, a wood fireplace for heat during the winter. Okay. And so being out there and uh, we have to go get our own wood and split our own wood and that sort of thing. And being in the dirt and smelling, you know, the pine and all that kind of stuff is very grounding. And the whole being Sounds around nature. Lovely. So those are some things that I try to focus on amongst the chaos of being a wife and mom. Okay. Yes. So what about when you're gardening, when you're doing, you're splitting your own wood? I mean, the wood part, I would say your focus is probably the most important thing with an ax. Uh, but yeah. when you're gardening, do you find yourself in your own mind or are you pretty concentrated on the work? Um. I think it's a space that allows me to kind of do both. Um, I've, I don't know, b being who I am, I multitask all the time. I try to anyway, it's not wow. getting as easy as it used to be, but um, a lot of times I will be out in the garden doing things and I will take that time to make phone calls to friends or family or whatever and reach out. And usually it's time for myself. You know, the kids will know that I'm out in the garden um, and they're tired of pulling weeds. And so, you know, it's my own space now. <laughs> um, That's a, a lot of times, you know, I'll good get way to, to get away. <laughs> Put yourself yeah. in work where they don't right. want to work with you. <laughs> right. They'll come and, you know, eat the watermelon and the corn and all the things. But then when it's the work time in the garden, they're oh. out. So. Okay. Um. But I, I don't know, again, just being in nature is very helpful to allow my thoughts to process and my emotions and that sort of thing. And to really, you know, whatever I'm going through or thinking about or whatever's on the, the day planner or whatever, um, you know, kind of work out all of the details the best that yeah. I can. So does life ever go... I mean, I should ask, does life ever go not according to plan? But I feel like I should ask, does life ever go according to plan? <laughs> no. The, the simple answer is no. You can't, in life, I guess that's another life lesson that I've learned, um, is acceptance is a good thing to really work towards in all aspects of life, especially knowing regardless of how hard you plan or whatever details, there's so many unknown variables that can shift and change. And it's okay when life doesn't go to a plan. Do you have any fun anecdotes about a time that 
life didn't go according to plan and it kind of went in a funny direction or in a, a direction where you learned a lot? All of it. I mean, you know, do, how much time do we have? <laughs> I just say one, one of these experiences. Um, I don't know necessarily about funny. Um, but you know, you have this idea of how life should go and what you want from life, and um, I guess going back to the whole schooling thing. You know, my dad is an engineer, electrical engineer, and I thought, oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to school to be an electrical engineer. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. There. So I started out um, at a community college, and I took engineering classes. And I'm like, well, you know, I should explore my options. So maybe I want to go into business. So I did take some business classes at the same time. And then I also had the, the thought of, you know, I kind of have this pool to become a teacher and to go into special education. And so I did that too. And then I got to the crossroads of, I mean, your math changes, whichever path you take yeah. and you've, you know, you've got to take these steps to move forward and I couldn't decide. So I stopped. So I'm still working on who I want to be when I grow up at 41. I still don't know. <laughs> so I did go back to school at one point in time thinking I was going to go into teaching and then, you know, life shifted again and that wasn't for me. So I've, you know, still back to the drawing board of finding out my passions, I guess, in life other than my kids and my husband. So <laughs> I mean, didn't you think when we were kids, like everyone kind of as adults looking at adults that they had their lives figured out, they knew what they wanted for their careers, and they were just kind of set on their plan. Yes. And I, I went through what you're discussing, uh, you're describing at the end of high school, when everyone was already decided on the career path, they were going to school. Yeah, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I looked at neuroscience and neurological surgery and you know some of these areas because I was good at you know medical stuff my dad being a doctor and right. under pressure and good at math and science and yep. you know all of this and then and then people would tell me oh you're so good at hair you should go into hair and I'm like oh I don't want to go into hair like yeah. <laughs> you know our People would always say that you're so good at this. You should do this. You're, you know, you should do this. And none of it sounded interesting to me. Right. Um, so at the end of the day, I did the same thing. I gave up. I said, I, I don't have the money to spend on not knowing. And, right. And so I, I didn't initially go. I didn't go back to university until I was 27. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, even then I started with psychology and I realized that becoming a therapist or a psychotherapist was absolutely not the way I wanted to go. Learned yeah. a lot of really interesting things. Um, the mind and the brain have always fascinated me, but at the end of the day, I, I think that it's just something that you're figuring out about yourself as to where you want to go and what you want to do. Yes. And yeah, as an adult, I'm like, do people really have it figured out at this age, at our age in life now? I mean, maybe they did 20 years ago. They were like, no, nope, this is my path. I'm going to keep doing it. But in our day and age, is this a really a thing anymore? Are there people at our age that have it figured out and they're like, no, this is what I'm doing the rest of my life? What do you think? Some people, and that's okay. <laughs> Let them, you know. <laughs> I feel like every day I'm like, I don't know what to do today. What's what's going to be my direction? Uh, and uh, and in the beginning, this is one of the reasons why I thought I was broken, because I yeah. thought everyone that I saw around me had it figured out and knew what they wanted, and I was not one of those people. And so there must yeah. be something wrong with me. I and can relate to that. I tried to fit into this category of, you know, this is what life should look like and this is what you should do and how you should do it. And, you know, you graduate high school and you go on to university and then you graduate university and probably hopefully while you're there as a woman, 
you should get married and then you should start having babies and maybe you go back and finish your degree and you know and then this is the rest of your life right and I got to the end of high school and I said "Uh -uh, I'm not sure about this next part and then I got through the next phase of life and I said oh I'm not sure about the best, the next part either. None of this feels right for me. And, and that's okay. And it, it made me feel even more broken. Yeah. Right. So like every time you come against this stereotype of what people expect life to be or to look like, or put out these, you know, this is what it was. Now right. it's not just a mother, but you should definitely have an education. You should be, you know, have a career. You should oh, maybe yeah. even start your own business. And of course you have to be the perfect mother at the same time and wife. Right. Yeah. And um, this is a lot of responsibility. A lot of pressure. <laughs> and a yes. lot of pressure. That's what it is. Yes. <laughs> And I'm not any of those things. And I feel the pressure. And I, I got to say, I don't think this life works for me. Um, You feel like that works for you? All of these expectations for today? No. Uh-uh. And I, I didn't, I didn't check off all those boxes either. You know, I, I had those moments of feeling broken and why, um, why is it so easy for other people or why are they not having these challenges or um, feeling that brokenness? But again, one, uh, a favorite quote is, you know, you can still color with broken crayons. Oh, see, I just, my husband's going to make fun of me. I have to call them Crayola sticks. Okay. <laughs> okay. He makes fun of me how I say that crayons, <laughs> crayons, anyhow. I mean, we all have those little things, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's but, um, good to keep you humble. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, along with the acceptance of I'm enough, we're enough, whatever we're doing, we're try as long as we're trying and not giving up, as long as we keep going, as long as, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we continue to try to figure out who we are. I feel like that's good enough. Yeah. Amen. I agree. <laughs> and I think redefining womanhood in every aspect of life and in every walk of life is a really important phase of where we are today. Yes. And there are some things coming out where women are feeling a little bit more of this shift. Um, But I think the, for me, the main focus isn't about whatever has happened in the past, whatever has happened in the world, whatever is, you know, corruption or other things. Um, For me, the, it always starts with inside. Where am I inside? How do I feel about myself? It doesn't matter what's going on outside. It's just right. about how I feel about my life path, my choices, what I'm doing. And that has been a fun trial to learn how to prioritize my own feelings over that of society and of the world around me, even when it is women-based. Yes. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with all of it all the time. And right. that's part of me and that's, that's okay too. And that's one of the things that I want to do with this, with this She she Speaks, She Thinks Fierce series is open up the concept of what womanhood is and what it means to be strong inside of yourself and live life how you want, regardless of what's going on and who is around you. Right. So we are going to wrap up a little bit here, but I want to know from you, if there was one thing that you could teach someone or tell someone, or even teach your younger self today, what would it be? Um, taking care of yourself down to the core is probably one of the most important things along with breathing and feeding yourself and, you know, drinking water and all those things self-care and taking care of your mental state and all of those kind of things should be a top priority. 
before all the other things. You can't pour, as they say, you can't pour from an empty cup. Amen. Uh, on flights, I always find this really interesting. They kind of reiterate this over and over and over again. When every time you get on the flight, right, they say, you have to put your mask on before yep. you can help your children. Because if you're unconscious, you can't do anything for them. Yep. And that concept, I know it goes kind of against that initial mothering instinct. Yep. But at the same time, if you have nothing to give, how are you going to help? Right. Even your own, even your own family, even your own kids. Yep. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I think um, as women, we definitely need to learn is even when you're not a mom, there's always this push to want to help other people, even if yeah. your life is falling apart. And I think that's, that's great in some areas and it can be really helpful, but mm -hmm. making sure you focus on yourself and do what you need for you and take that quiet time to have your, your less than 10% days. Yeah. I think this is vital. I do, um, yes. And honestly, I, I don't think I would survive without it, but not guilting ourselves about it. I think that's the push that I wanted to make too, with that newsletter specifically was we're going to have these days, whether you like it or not, because sometimes your brain is just going to say, no, not going to happen today. <laughs> yep. And that's okay. You know, yeah. the house can sit a mess. The mess will be there. You know, the dishes <laughs> will be there. All the things will be there. But it's being able wait. to take care of yourself. Yeah. Being uh -huh. able to take care of yourself is vital. Yeah. Exactly. So I am so grateful for you coming on here and experimenting with me today at the beginning mm -hmm. of our series. Uh I'm sure. I'll get better, much better at this process as we continue on, but your expertise and your life has always been an inspiration to me. And so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you first on here. I know that there are going to be other women who can also find empowerment and strength in your story. And I love you. And I'm so grateful for you to be here. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And we're going to end with that, ladies. Everyone, be strong, be happy, be healthy, and remember to prioritize your mental, physical, emotional health because you're worth it. And there isn't anything that you can't do as long as you're willing to put yourself in that category of worthy of love. And you are. So thanks again. See you later next time.